Well, welcome back to Bible Doctrines. Today we start a new section, section 5.3. So go ahead and turn to page number 75 and let's get started here. You know, I've been thinking about a lot about the essential questions that we've had. We've had a lot of them. It's almost like, wow, all these essential questions. But think about it. These are things that we actually do contemplate. You know, and there's even questions that aren't in our book, you know, that are essential questions. And I came up with one for this section. How about this? How did the ancient Bible text get into our hands? This is a question that has fascinated me. You know, in our section, this lesson is going to speak to this process. We're going to talk about how the Bible got from the writings of the original authors, inspiration, to the transmission of the text down through the centuries, to the translation of the text into a Bible that I can read. You know, as we look at this, it is just amazing to think about. And as we start out here, I want to note there's a key word that incorporates both transmission and translation. This is what we're going to be talking about in this section. What's that key word? It is preservation. Now, I like raspberry preserves. And my mom used to preserve everything. She used to can everything. And I remember she would make jams and jellies. And I loved raspberry preserves where you took the original fruit and then you, you cut it up and then boiled it down and did some things, put it in a jar and sealed it. And it was made in such a way that it lasted for quite some time. You know, a year, a year and a half later, we could open up the can and the raspberry preserves were great. So we talk about preservation. We know it's talking about taking something from this point and preserving it for a length of time. So how has the Bible been preserved down through the years? What is the evidence of the preservation of God's word? Well, let me state this. The transmission and translation of God's word are evidence of its preservation. The fact that it has been transmitted down through the years and it's been translated in so many different languages, this shows us that God is de had determined to preserve his word. And we see this even in the text of scripture. In Psalm 119, verse 152 Look what the Bible says. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. And then we look in verse 160. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. And then if we look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 to 25, it says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So we have this corollary between inspiration, transmission, and translation. And that corollary is preservation. Now, a seminary professor named William Combs he wrote two statements in a journal article on the preservation of the scriptures, and I really think these are interesting. He said this, there is no real purpose or value in inspiring a document that is not preserved. And then he later stated, without preservation, the purpose of inspiration would be invalidated. What is he saying there? He's saying that if a document isn't going to be preserved, then why would God inspire it in the first place? There's no reason to inspire a document that you're not planning on preserving. So when God inspired his word, it was already in his mind that he is going to preserve this word down through the ages. And we're going to see that just as God is sovereign over everything else in the universe, he is sovereign over the preservation of his unfailing word. So when we talk about transmission, the transmission of our text, we have to talk about preservation. And I'm going to look at two realities of the preservation of God's word today. First, we see that God didn't see fit to preserve the autographa. Autographa, that's a word you came up with in your reading. And there was actually a thinking it through question in regards to this word. Number one, define the term autographa. All right, how did you define it? It's simply this. The original documents on which the biblical writers recorded God's breathed out words. 
Now, when you answer this question, you may have added self-writings, which is really what the word means. And that's okay, but only if you added the rest too, because we need to understand how this refers to the Bible. Now, we've, retur- we've referred to this term before. You know, these were the actual documents written by Moses, the prophets, the apostles, the writers of the human writers of the scriptures. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to show you pictures of manuscripts. But I'll tell you this, I can't show you a picture of one of the autographer. Because what? Well, because we don't currently possess any of the original manuscripts. They don't exist anymore. And I want to ask you this question. Why do you think that God didn't supernaturally preserve the autographa? Why don't we have the, one of the original documents today? Well, one thing I would think of is possibly if we had such a treasure, it would be made into a re- religious relic and then it would be venerated and worshipped. And so God chose for whatever reason, maybe that reason, not to preserve the autographa. Well, we talk about preservation then, well, if the autographer has not been preserved, then how do we have the Bible in our hands? Well, there's another reality of preservation, and that's this. The Bibles we have today are translated from copies of the originals. In fact, the Bible that you hold in your hands is a translation of a copy 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 of a copy. That's That's how it works. Transmission was copied down through the years. These documents were copied and recopied and copied over again. And that's how we have our Bibles today. Now, this brings me to another very important word in our study. And that's the word providential. Now, we've looked at the word providential before. You know what it indicates. But think about it. God didn't just drop a Bible down into a people group in their language. You know, like he didn't say, okay, the Russian people need a Bible, dropped one in there. Or the English speaking people needed a Bible and he just dropped one in there. It's not how it happened. You know, he didn't even supernaturally make the autographs indestructible. Because think about it. You know, the autographs, the original writings, he could have made them indestructible so they never, ever wore out. But he didn't do that. And he didn't have one main document containing all the books of the Bible supernaturally exist down through history. What happened is that God providentially, through history, through mankind, he used these people to copy and copy and copy the manuscripts. He used those to preserve his word. So we want to look at this process of transmission, and it's a very fascinating study. We won't have the time to go into it in depth But when we think about this process of transmission, this copying, copying, copying to what we have today, you think about it, for me today, it's very easy to make a copy of something. You know, if I'm on my computer and I need to copy something, I'll just electronically send that document to the printer, it prints it out and it's there. But think about copy machines. Copy machines didn't exist before the early 1950s. So this is more of a recent ability to do. And so if you think about it, we didn't have copy, they didn't have copy machines. And in fact, Gutenberg's printing press, which was an amazing invention, this didn't come along until the mid-1400s. And ironically, the very first book printed on that press was the Bible. Well, let's get back to our discussion here. So they didn't have copy machines, they didn't have a printing press, So how was the text transmitted before that? Well, let's look at the definition of transmission. This is the process of copying biblical manuscripts. Now, look at your guided notes. I've summarized this process to give us an overview. And your textbook gives you so much more detail. So be familiar with those details. Well, soon after the biblical writers recorded God's words, copies were made, and then those were used by God's people. Eventually, the originals or the autographer dropped out of existence, but copyists diligently sought to preserve the writings of the manuscripts that they had. God used scribes to to establish a meticulous and accurate transmission process for the Old Testament. God used monks and other careful scribes to carefully copy the New Testament documents. And to get a feel for what what they would have to do, let's do an exercise. We're going to pretend that we're scribes and that we're handwriting a manuscript. So I want you to pause your video and I want you to carefully write out Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 7, just those first seven verses. 
and I want you to use printed letters only. So print it out, printed letters, and I want you to time yourself to see how long it takes, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about it. So how long did that take you? It took me about 10 minutes, but I carefully took every letter and, and copied it. So when we think about the time, you know, it may have taken you less time or may have taken you more time, but think about how the copyist, how they had to do it, and they had to do it for the entire text of the book. You know, they had a manuscript here, maybe of the entire book of Ephesians, and they were copying from this manuscript over to another manuscript. That would have taken a lot of time. And as we discuss the transmission of the text, we're going to focus today on the New Testament text. And with that, I want you to note this. The New Testament has been preserved better than any other ancient work of literature. And concerning the New Testament manuscripts, let's look at your thinking it through question. Question number three. Explain the difference between the manuscript tradition of the New Testament and that of other ancient texts. And we would say this, first, the number of available manuscripts is overwhelming compared to that of other historical works. Look at that statement, write it in your guided notes. The number is overwhelming compared to other historical works. So take your book and let's go to page number 77. I want to show you this. You probably saw this in your reading, but that graph there on the top of page 77 where it says the number of copies in existence. If you'll notice here, the uh, copies of the writings of Plato, of Caesar, and of Homer pale in comparison to the numbers of copies or the numbers of manuscripts of the New Testament. If you notice there, it says there's over 5,000 manuscripts that we have today of the New Testament. And actually, there's about 5,800 and these manuscripts range from small little fragments to completed copies of the New Testament. And these manuscripts, they're very interesting to study. And as we look at this, I want to see, show you the overwhelming evidence of the New Testament manuscript line. And I want to just look at a few of these manuscripts. First, we have Papyrus 53. This contains Matthew 26, verses 29 to 40, and Acts chapter 9, verses 30 through to chapter 10, verse 1. And this is a copy from the third century. And this is a bifolio from Paul's letter to the Romans, the end of Paul's letter to the Philippians, and the beginning of Paul's letter to the Colossians. This manuscript contains 86 folios or pages of parchment or papyrus. This manuscript is the oldest surviving, almost complete copy of the Pauline epistles because 86 of its original 112 folios have survived. And this document is later dated to the second or the third century. And then let's look at this one. This is a page from Codex Alexandrinus. This is a fifth century manuscript. It contains the majority of the Old Testament in Greek and the Greek New Testament. And we see here a page with the text of Mark chapter 6, verses 27 to 54. These are just a few of the manuscripts that we have available to us today. And the interesting thing is, that besides the 5,800 Greek manuscripts, there are over 10,000 Latin translation manuscripts. There are over 9,300 other early versions. And think about this. In the citations of the early church fathers, the early church leaders, they would write about things. They would write about the sermons. They would write about the scriptures. Concerning their, concerning their citations, Bruce Metzger, in his book, The Text of the New Testament, says this. So extensive are the citations from the church fathers that if all the other sources for our knowledge of the text of the New Testament were destroyed, they would be sufficient alone for the reconstruction of practically the entire New Testament. So we have all these manuscripts, we have all these early translations, and we even have the citations of the early church leaders. The, the, the manuscript evidence is, is so abundant concerning the New Testament text. But let's now look at another interesting thing about the New Testament manuscripts. Go back to question number three. Explain the difference between the manuscript tradition of the New Testament and that of other ancient texts. We can say this. There were fewer years between the originals and the first copies we have today than with other historical documents. 
So fewer years between the originals and the first copies. Now let's again go back to your textbook. On page number 77, let's look at that graph again. There's another one here. You see here the number of years between original manuscripts and other copies in existence. You see the New Testament, it's only about 125 years, uh, not even that, excuse me, about 100 years at the most between the original copy and one of the first copyists that we have today. But if you notice in Homer or Caesar or Plato's writings, there's a lot more distance between the original writing and one of its first copies that we have today. And so when we look at this, we see that there are some old New Testament manuscripts. And let's look at one of those instances today. Here we have Papyrus 52. This is the oldest known manuscript fragment of the New Testament. And it contains a portion of the Gospel of John. It's dated to AD 125. It's close to the original documents. No other ancient document comes close to this. Now there's so much more that we could say. And like your book puts, your book has a lot more in it. And we haven't even addressed the Dead Sea Scrolls. And those are Old Testament manuscripts. But let me say this. This field of manuscript study is incredible. In fact, if I wasn't a teacher, I would get involved in this type of research. And I would encourage you to do some more research on this. There, there are a lot of things that you can look into, books, uh, maybe some online resources, to see the amazing um, thought of the manuscript evidence of the New Testament. So let me encourage you, if that interests you, you know, jump at it. It's, it's a very interesting study. So as we close today, go ahead and take out your student activity book, and I want to talk about your prayer journal assignment. So go to page 142, page number 142, and let's look here. Section 5.3, you're going to do your prayer journal assignment off of this. I just want to read this because it really helps, it helps us to kind of solidify what we've talked about today. He says here, Thank the Lord for the hard work of all who have carefully copied and translated God's word down through the centuries. Praise him that you have an accurate and authoritative record, authoritative record of God's word in your own language. Pray that God would equip Bible translators and missionaries to carry the word of God to even more people in their own languages. Ask the Lord to help you discover whether he may be calling you to assist with Bible translation in the future. Or ask the Lord to show you how you could financially support for, uh, Bible translators all around the world. And I just wanted to give you that, that personal uh, challenge. You know, this is something to think about. At a, person, at a young person your age, thinking about what God has for you for the future, maybe get involved in manuscript work, um, translation work, so that other people can have a copy of the Word of God in their language. So when we talk about translation here, I want you to join me next time as we answer this important question. Do I have the Word of God in my language? That's a great question and we'll discuss it next time. We'll see you then.